day to discuss the book, uh, so the mm -hmm. book you wish your parents had read, and your children will be glad that you did. As you understand already from the title, it's so hard like raising a child, so you know, it's uh, the topic is of this debate. So uh, let's move forward to the next slide. But before we start uh, our presentation, I'd like to tell you that, uh, firstly, uh, I, I don't plan to have a one-sided monologue, so whenever you feel you want to say something, drop a question or say whatever, just raise your hands and, uh, and speak. And uh, the, second, the second thing is that I want to make it interactive. I have included some uh, activities and exercise that were inside the book, so we can all play in this one. And I also want to ask you a question, and please raise your hand and keep it in the air. Uh, firstly, if you have read this book in the past, if you are parents and have kids, if you plan to have kids in the future, if you don't want to have kids, if you're not sure if you want to have kids, or if you were kids in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, this book is for all of you, and it's what about. Uh, when I first was recommended to read this book in my mind, I thought it would be like the perfect guide on how to be a parent when I had my boy, and uh, how to be the perfect uh, parent. And uh, basically what this book is, is exactly the opposite of what I said, and by reading that, I understood how wrong I was when I was expecting to have a guy that would tell me how you would be uh, the perfect uh, father. This book is not about this. This book uh, mostly is about uh, psychotherapy of our own selves, of the past, and of all the habits that we inherited from our past, and uh, how uh, uh, the author proposes some solutions in order to start communicate and to, in order to embrace the feelings of our kid and not just our kid but in general of our close people and the, and the people we interact. So it basically that, that, that deals with the ways we, we connect with all those. Uh, this book was published in 2019 and became Sunday's uh, time the number one bestseller. And two quotes I found in the internet and I really like them and I think they describe more or less the book. It's like, uh, it's like a letter from a wise friend who has made years of research on the topic. And every parent should read this book, it's a must. So uh, we can uh, move on to the next slide where we have uh, a slide for the author. She's Felipa Perry, she's British, was born in 59, and she's a well-known psychotherapist, author and presenter. She's very experienced in family therapy and has done a lot of uh, work with individuals and with families with great results in her life. She's uh, an author, uh, except of this book of uh, How to Stay Sane and of Couch Fiction, which uh, is basically a graphic novel that mystifies the, um, the psychotherapy itself. She has a great experience in many topics like uh, mental health, parenting, and personal growth, and that's why she's a very sought-after speaker. Uh, she has suffered from dyslexia. She's uh, very politically active, and she fights mostly for women's rights, and has worked uh, as a litigation clerk, beside all the other things she has done, as an inquiry agent. Uh, as a McDonald's employee, and uh, was, uh, has also a degree in fine arts. So we can move to the next slide. We will start with uh, one of the most important topics in the book on the parenting legacy. Uh, when we, uh, how the way she uh, understands and she explains the parenting legacy, it's like a big chain where every generation is a specific link on this chain. So when we say that the past comes back to bite us and our children, uh, we should all uh, understand that um, children, for those who have, uh, will never do what you tell them to do. Children basically will, will do what they see you do. And uh, so uh, in, this, uh, in this relation with the kids, uh, we are the basic, uh, the role model. So, um, 
since uh, the kids, or the action of the kid, are reflected on our actions, and uh, that comes also for us and to our past, because um, uh, the way the kids do what we do um, uh, wakes up memories of our past. So in this way, our past is one that um, plays a huge role in our present through our kids and will reflect the future on the action of our kids. So we should uh, like see this whole parental legacy as I told you as a big change here. Um, what does a kid mostly need? A kid mostly needs affection, love, the physical conduct of a hug, uh, needs uh, understanding, needs to play with him. That's the basic thing that a kid needs and will be happy. And then comes the question, if we think that that's the thing that the kid needs and we all understand that that's its need, why do we have this discussion? Why do we have these books and why all the parents are starting to understand how they will solve problems of communication there? Because we have like actual things that happen uh, in our lives and basically uh, what is blocking us from doing all those, it's life itself. Uh, we have to work. We don't have time to spend for our kids because we have to be working, we have anxiety, we have time management issues, we have uh, money issues, um, we have other obligations that we have daily. So all these things uh, don't make us the person we would like to be when we return home to our kids. Uh, but even above this, um, uh, the, the, the biggest thing, uh, as we discussed also previously, is the, the past and our memories from our childhood. So, for instance, if I had like a bad childhood and some bad memories, maybe the way I act to my kids is like a reflection of this. And maybe this could be proved to be the biggest block and the biggest uh, issue in, uh, in establishing a good connection with, uh, with my kid. Um, it's very often to, when we speak to our kids, and maybe you have heard that from your parents or from people that are also are for your friends and our parents, like when I speak to my kid, I feel like I listen to my mother or my father. Why does that happen? I mean, I don't want to be him. It's because we have all these memories and these things are part of ourselves that sometimes when something bad happens, like uh, our kid breaks a glass, at the same point we, we, we are thinking, okay, uh, with, without understanding that, okay, he breaks his glass and uh, I have to shout at him because probably when we were kids and we did something bad, our parents treat us like that. So it is very unique to identify the part of the chain that has the problem and, and do something uh, about that. Um, so uh, this... What, what, do, what do you mean, or what does she mean by doing something with that? I mean, uh, to... How, how not, not to uh, accept that your mom was doing something in your childhood or what? It's like you have to make um, a step back and don't be the one that starts shouting, and don't be the one that will uh, try not to embrace his emotion or what he feels at the moment, but start to understand that, okay, he did something, I don't have to like uh, be the example of other that shouts, because that kid will at the moment create a distance with me, and maybe if I would be a different father at the moment, and try to say, okay, that's not a big deal. Let's make, a, we will we'll fix that glass. The important for me is that you didn't break it. Maybe, okay, for that moment, nothing will happen, but in the future, I will have established a good connection between us. So if something else happens, he will feel okay to, to connect with me. Yeah, it's clear, but then what to do in your brain, how to act, it's clear. You shouldn't shout. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, I, I know it's difficult then, especially with this uh, daily routine, it's a little hard sometimes not to yell at someone, let's say, and not even your kid, I mean, to your colleague or a close friend, your parents, you sometimes feel so down, that's okay, you, the first thing you do perhaps is shout or whatever, but in all this occasion, and that is one thing I like here, that it, it's not about the kids, it's about all our 
relationship, whatever that relations are, is that you always have to make a step back and you have to consider, uh, you have to consider how you don't make a rupture, which the next thing we're gonna discuss here. Uh, um, so yeah, probably I'll go to the rupture with uh, your help here, and then I will go to the exercise I was planning to. So uh, the, the thing on these occasions that happen regularly in this uh, in our daily life is the rupture and the repair. Rapture is the moment that um, um, we take wrong assumptions, we shout at someone, we, we hurt our most loved uh, people, and uh, it's, it's a moment that has uh, like an importance when you do this kind of thing. But uh, even when we do that to our favorite person, we do the rapture, at the, at the same time, this is not the most important thing that will happen in between our connection. The most important thing has to do with the repair. Um, in order to do the repair, and for instance, even if we had shouted at our kid when it break the glass, what we have to do is to work on our reaction, to have a step back and to consider what we did, uh, we can focus and see what we did wrong and what we can, um, what was the thing that triggered inside us this rapture? Perhaps it was something like a hidden emotion or a hidden thing that we had it in our past that we used to have this kind of uh, emotions taken from our parents and perhaps that is what is making, making us react like that. So we have to work with ourselves, we have to understand things, to understand why we think this way and after that, when we understand where is this problem, we can do this work with the repair and we can say, okay, it was a moment. I want to discuss with you what happened previously about the glass and it wasn't such a big thing. It wasn't a major, it was something really minor and everybody breaks glasses and it's totally okay to do stuff like that. So uh, if you like, we can do an exercise. I don't know if any one of you would like to be like a volunteer or we can do everyone on his mind. Uh, about where does that, uh, where do that feelings come from? I want you to remember, or if you, if anyone wants to volunteer, he can, we can do it with him. I want you to remember the latest time of you, you had like an intense feeling, like for instance anger towards uh, a loving uh, person of you. So you want to remember this, when was it, and to try to understand where that feeling may come from and you have to dig your past. You have to see does, if that feeling has similarities with feelings that you had when you were kids, for instance. Yeah, And the, feel, the, feel, the feeling <laughs> of anger, or the feeling when you feel sorry that you felt that anger? The, the anger, I mean, ah, okay. mm -hmm. it is a feeling that I take this example that my kid break a glass, mm -hmm. so I say, okay, I mad at you and I shout at you. And that's the last thing I remember before I come into to this uh, place. So I remember I felt anger for this thing. Could have been that someone was angry at me because I did this thing when I was young. So if you could relate, not ever, let's say the latest, that you have a good memory, the latest feeling that you experienced with something that happened in your childhood. And perhaps you will identify that some of your, uh, not all, but some of your uh, daily reactions may be some buttons that are triggered inside yourself. Um, okay, um, so uh, regarding the repairing, um, the, let's say our kid did something bad. Whatever he does, in whatever age of his or she's, uh, the kid reminds, we see himself, if I say it more correctly, we see in him, the, our, ourself in his age. Uh, so we understand that if we see himself acting and we identify ourselves like him in his age, that how much we have been um, uh, effect, uh, how much we're affected by our past and what things that happened in our life, in our past, are still affecting us. So, 
many things that happened in the past were good things. And uh, if, for example, let's say I, I think I do some things that I want to uh, inherit them to my kid, I hope they will be good things. Because maybe I think I have a good past, but at the same time, we all have bad things that happen in our childhood and in our past. And it's very critical for us as parents and for every relationship that we have with the people we interact that we stop from uh, putting on the back, especially with the kids, this kind of uh, bad emotions and we start only inheriting only good things and only good emotions because if we put these bad things on his back, we will start making a kid feel lonely, feel depressed, feel he's doing something bad, something wrong. So, of course, it's logical at some times that, uh, as we said, it's the daily life. You will feel bad at some point. You will feel that you don't have any energy and you won't be the best example of a parent. But still, that's not, not a problem. That's logical. The thing is that you have to repair the damage that may have been done in the past and you have to take a step back, think, and do the best that you could for, the, for your kid. Um, and so an exercise on this one, it's a second. Again, if someone would like to volunteer, uh, this one is harder. So this is a message from our memories, meaning that um, everyone has, if he tries to dig up a lot, the, late, the, the, the earliest memory he had in his life. It's something that you remember. The first time that you remember yourself, you say, ah, maybe it was that at that age. And although you remember, you can remember, maybe not very well, but well, your first memory as a human being, maybe you don't remember at all, and there is a reason for that, um, what emotions came along with this memory. So, uh, if you'd like, I'd like you to think of what is the first ever memory you remember of yourselves, and now, with your mindset, like grown up, to try to understand what emotions did this brought you. So, for a reason, there was this kind of memory. And if eventually, and that's the purpose of the exercise, understand that there is an emotion behind this memory, that means you are starting to identify some hidden emotion, and you are starting to do work with yourself, which is the important thing here. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, uh, other two important things about the parenting legacy is the, the, the how we talk to ourselves and the part of the parents. So, about how we talk to ourselves, every one of us has a like and a voice in his head, and he listens to that voice almost daily. Uh, that voice will mostly be like an inner judge, which will be very a bad judge. Like, I'm coming here to present this book and I hear this voice telling me, you suck, you won't do it, you do it. <laughs> Why are you going? It's boring and nobody would like to listen. That's normal, that's normal to have this voice inside us. But the thing is, what is the work we want to do with that voice? Because if I let this voice influence me and I uh, lower my self-esteem and say, okay, yeah, I cannot do it. You are not good at work. Yeah, I'm not so good, so I, I can't do much. This will reflect it to the person around me, and mostly will reflect it to my kid. And the worst thing that I could do to my kid is, uh, okay, not he wouldn't understand if he was young, but maybe better. But having a low self-esteem is something natural. That his inner voice is something very natural to hear and to have his inner judge and say, okay, I cannot do much because I'm not uh, very well at what I'm doing. And even worse, he wouldn't be criticized himself for many things. He could also criticize people around him and other kids. That would be something if you let this inner judge inside you um, take power. So there are some steps that we need to do to avoid this inner judge as much as we can. First is to track down what, what they're saying. For instance, if this inner judge, they told me, don't go to the presentation, I have to write it down. Second thing, and it's very important, is that I, ha I, I don't have to act towards him like it's the guy. Okay, you have your point, I hear you, I don't care, speak whatever you want, but I have my goals. Number three, 
I put my goals, and the goals are those that my inner voice would say that you can't do it. You, you are not capable of doing the presentation. I would say, okay, I will do this presentation, and when I have the result and it's finished, I would say that, yes, I can do it, and you are wrong here. And the final, and okay, most important part, because it affects kids, is if you understand that your kid is starting to influence, uh, to be influenced from you and adopting this kind of behaviors, then the first thing you have to do is to control and don't let him take this, uh, this uh, habit as his. And uh, okay, let's go to the, to the final part that had to do with the, uh, maybe I have an exercise, but because I see that you don't be very, you don't, you don't like to interact a lot, I don't do. But uh, if you'd like, you could, for instance, uh, Tell me, tell us if you have like this kind of experience and uh, what your reader does. There is, there is an alternative for this uh, exercises. Uh, you can buy your son a golden needle, and every time he, he, it, it was like an exercise from ancient times when mothers were, um, let's say, treating their children. Every time they think something bad about themselves. They should uh, put this, take this needle and punch its, okay. itself. <laughs> so it, it 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 makes you stop punishing yourself inside your head. Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's physically stops you from from being uh, judged by your internal judge and say it like that. And it it makes you feel like okay, I'm doing it. I'm. Yeah, I'm f I fuck up, but I'm doing that. So, and you stop judging yourself for this uh, fuck up. So, th it was like, uh, and I was doing these exercises, let's say, not with a real golden needle, but with a virtual one. So, like, let's say, every time I say to myself that uh, you did something wrong, I imagine that I should, uh, let's say, take this needle and uh, stop myself. So it, 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 let's say, tells you, well, it, it's not that bad. And if you will do it from childhood, when you, when you grow up, you don't have this issue. That, I got that my other actual needle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's golden because it doesn't have, um, uh, let's say, any bacteria, so you won't uh, <laughs> Very practical advice. I can share my experience, not so interesting <laughs> one. But with this inner judge, I'm overthinker, so we have one problem, we think lots and have this guilty and so on. And for me, it was a decision to stick with my inner judge. So just to speak, uh, okay, you will fuck up in presentation. Why do you think so? Uh, because you just very bad in English. Okay, what should I do with this? You should practice. Okay, well, where I can get practice? For example, presentation, maybe I should go. So you just have this conversation, and after that, I discovered that my inner judge judged me because he has fear and was punished in childhood. So, and he's not he's not strong as me, that's why he can shut up and I can go to do the presentation. So in this case, when I discover my inner judge as a person who is afraid to be punished and ashamed, I feel like a power woman that can go to this presentation and fail, because it can fail and it can win. Maybe this conversation with your inner child can help you to understand. It depends on the culture that you are from. In some cultures, it's not the right way to start a conversation, just punch first and then that's just yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's one of the options. Golden needle is also an option. I'm back on previous one. It was just uh, sorry. No, no, I think it's a good one. Sorry. No, I like this kind of interaction. It's better, and I think your approach is correct because, in my mind, the inner judge is like uh, since he's. Um, thinking is somehow evil and he has a smaller thing, he doesn't have the values that you say that I want to do something and I want to try and understand if I make a mistake. He's someone that only judges, so 
it doesn't share the same values like you. So yeah, you can't say in the end, okay, sorry, but you lost this competition, let's say. And as for the golden eagle, yeah, that's true. It's it could be a solution, although I, I'm not in favor of, let's say, taking the the, the mental damage and the <laughs> spiritual damage to, to actual damage, but it's okay, it could be the ancient guys do some stuff sometimes. So yeah, um, let's go to the final part of the parent legacy, which is about the good parent and the bad parent. And it's about what I told you when I first uh, read that book, that I wanted to be a good parent. But when I understand, uh, when I, I read that, I understand that when we say good or bad, when we go to the edges, nothing could be good. We, we are not perfect. There is no good and there is no bad. Uh, sometimes good parents could be someone that has like a, a face that's smiling and everything is okay, but eventually he's someone that has many nerves and he's like hypocrite in his uh, actions toward his kid. While at the same time, someone with a level bad part could be someone that's that very grimy, very bad tempered, but at the same time, builds honest relationship with him. I don't say that always one would be better from the other and so on, but I mean, labels never help. And uh, the same goes for the kids, because we cannot say that a kid is good and a kid is bad, because when we characterize and we put like um, uh, boxes in people, it's like we don't. At first, we don't help him, uh, help them being better, progress, to feel like they try something to change. If we say to a kid, you are a good kid, maybe that kid will say, okay, I'm good, so I have to act in a specific way every time, so I have every time to be like the best student for my parents, and uh, perhaps I don't have to defend myself against some other kids that are the bad kids and so on. And at the same time, if we say to a kid that you're a, a, a bad kid, uh, it, it, it's so bad because uh, we don't allow him to try to make an effort to change himself. He will say, I have this label and this label cannot change. So, in general, what we have to do is like uh, praise the effort of what our kids are doing and um, encourage them to do stuff and not like put table and uh, put uh, labels and characterize. So let's say as an example, uh, I'll take two examples. Let's say one for the kid. We have a kid that it's very good in maths, let's say as we say. He would tell him, yes, you are very excellent in maths and we tell to everyone he's excellent in maths. We put this label on him and that can be very um, constructive. It would be much better to speak to him and tell him, yes, um, I think uh, I saw you give a big effort when you uh, were reading this uh, exercise and tried to do it and I'm very proud of you. That's a, a, a much better way to talk to him. And the same goes like when we say, for instance, um, I suck and lean the hop. I'm not good. No, you're not bad. You can say that I'm a newbie, I just started doing so and I see progress in myself and I feel very good about it. And that's why all of this is basically the way we feel our parent legacy. So even the example of the inner judge, if you do it, you can, you can close your eyes and think a bad voice about something you do. And see, that bad voice does remind you from someone. Is that someone maybe from your childhood, like a parent, could be like a colleague that's always trying to judge everything and so on. Because sometimes, yeah, it's not only about the kids, it's the senior judge could be everywhere and could be like, if you close your eyes and who would say that to me? And maybe I hear a voice and it's, it's a person I know, probably, and it, it affects me so much. That now I, I understand deeply that I have the senior judge and this feeling came from this one and so on. Um, okay, so yeah, we can move on to the... Uh, next topic, which is uh, our child environment. Uh, this topic, um, uh, the author started to write in it because she was influenced from a story she heard from a psychotherapist, she was, she was speaking. This guy was uh, speaking with refugees and mostly with kids of refugees and was trying to 
let's say, encourage and support them of what they were, of, of all the experience they had. So um, she, he, he was telling them, uh, what do you think that you don't have, uh, that you don't have a home? And they say that we do have a home. Home is where our people are. It's just we don't have a roof. So it's very important to understand that it's not the structure in general of what the family is, or, uh, uh, but about the connections that we build inside, inside this circle. And perhaps a family could be whatever we understand from a typical standard family, from heterosexual or whatever, or uh, from two, let's say, gay parents or for one uh, 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 partner family uh, and whatever. But the important thing is not who made, let's say, this family, but the relationship everyone make in this uh, in this home, let's say, with each other, and that we have like true and genuine connection to 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 each other. That's the basic thing. We try as parents, let's say, to create the best environment, like the best school, the best friends, the best family, the best everything. But if we are not genuine to ourselves and if we are not like honest to our kids and the way we create and we let's say like create a dream with each other honestly and we create something good, it, it will reflect. So that's the, the basic thing that we have to hear to surround, to feel the kid to feel this circle around him, this small circle that is surrounded by honest feelings. Uh, when parents are together, this is like a very important topic because nowadays not all kids have both their parents inside the home. And uh, maybe one parent left, let's say usually that happens with the fathers, that fathers leave and mothers stay behind. The kid still feels himself and ident identifies himself as half his mother, half his parents. So let's say even the parents just abandon him and he's not there. The, the role that the other uh, parent should play is not to say something good for the other in case he comes back in the future or whatever, but because the, the, the kid feeds half of himself this parent. So instead of saying like, your father abandoned us and uh, he was the worst person I ever know, you could say something, your parent was someone who wanted to travel and had an adventurous mindset and so on, so that he don't feel bad for himself. He's a sailor. Uh, yeah. The most <laughs> popular <laughs> explanation would be... He's a sailor that <laughs> travels 20 years. <laughs> okay, of course we know that as time passes, eventually difficult questions will pop up when the children will get bigger and eventually there will be like some hard situations that the other parents will have to deal with but still it's the best thing to make our kid and to create a connection with him that everything around him is good uh, all his parts are better so in order not to give him this kind of emotion that he will perhaps in the future feel like depressed, isolated and so on um, how to make pain bearable pain and sometimes, especially in the small kid, can be unbearable. Uh, they can cry for something that they feel it's like the end of the world. Even for us, it's, it's just a minor thing. In a patient like that, we don't have to speak. Or pain to friends of ours. We don't have to speak and say, like, I will tell you the perfect words that will make you see your pain. The, the thing we have to do is, like, I will be there for you. I will be there for you. And maybe we will tell him, or even to a friend, I mean, do you like a hug? I mean, I know it's pain, but maybe after this hug, whenever you feel that you want to leave this hug, things will be better. So we have to try things that it's not what we say, but sometimes our action, the, how, the way we want to communicate and connect with them, that's the important thing. And the last thing is, uh, in the slide about when parents are together, when parents are together, that doesn't, doesn't mean that things are better than when parents aren't together. Because sometimes parents are together for a reason uh, that they say, okay, the, the, the kid needs two figures inside the house, but still they are so bad in between them that it's like uh, the kid feels like in a war zone. Um, maybe since situation changes uh, in a new marriage, for instance, and the kid came, there is no time at all, 
Um, there are difficulties, difficulties between the partners uh, themselves and so on. So the best things that we have to do and the example we give to our kids is that we try our best. And even if the things aren't the best inside our, uh, let's say, in the couple, you could say something like, I understand I'm absent, I work a lot, but I really want to assist and be there for you. So with this kind of true connection, the kid understand that something good is going on. So it's very good to see that the environment of the kid should be an environment where people all are partners and are friends and they are not enemies. Okay. Um, let's go uh, to the next. We have two, the final two for this one. Yeah, you see that how the home is created. It's just the roof is needed. So um, yeah. Of course, every family has uh, disagreements. And of course, every family has uh, uh, big situations which are bad for the, even as a couple or as a family. But the thing is, when you try to discuss this kind of disagreement, to show respect to the other person and to all the participants inside the house. And uh, when you find these differences, not to try to say they don't exist and throw them away from your window, but to identify them and try to solve them. Uh, when there are arguments in, inside the houses, they are mostly, um, they, they have, let's say, four parts. The first part is the reason of the argument. The second part is how us, how I feel about this argument and how much confident, let's say, I feel that I am right. The third part is how the other person in the family feels and, feel, uh, and his feelings about this argument we have. And the fourth and last part is the part that we should do, is the part of resolving uh, uh, this argument and resolving in a constructive way. There are some conflict types that never do good in a situation like that and can be problem inside the inside the house. One of these, the most known of all, and if you like we could do an exercise like that to play this one, is the is the tennis argument. If you heard one, the tennis argument, yes, it's like let's say uh, I don't wash the dishes, so I go inside the house and my partners tell me why you don't uh, put the dishes in the sink and you leave it on the table? 15-0. You have tennis player with us too, so maybe they know the score. Uh, then I reply that, okay, I will put it later because I had some work to do now, 50-50. She replies back and said, and why then you leave it in the sink and you didn't wash it? 30-50. If you say, I will wash it, well, it's all together. I do that, I will spend much of time, 30-30. And then she said, but then bacteria will come to our house because of that. But then you say, no, bacteria will die when I was there. So this tennis argument is like the worst because eventually both will be very like uh, with no energy, left with no energy. And eventually there will be a winner and a loser. The loser will feel, will feel no affection for the other one, will, like, will feel disgusted about the other person, doesn't want to see him. And the winner will feel like um, above and like win a competition. But the thing here is like we don't have a competition, like we're a partner, so we have to resolve it, we don't have to fight with each other. Another kind of, uh, another type of argument is like the method of distraction that we mostly use uh, to our kids sometimes, which is bad. And sometimes we do that also to our relationship. It's the distraction, like we have a problem, why we don't go out a lot uh, together at night? Uh, I saw a good movie tonight, if you like, or we can see on Netflix this one. Or you say to a kid that is arguing that he wants an ice cream, oh, look, at, there's a dog over there. The distraction. But when we do the distraction, it's like we, we act more superficially. We say we don't discuss this thing. See that, and let's don't discuss this. So eventually, we have an superficial kindness between us, but we keep some things that are taboo things, that will never be discussed. So this eventually makes some topics like not discussed, we lose our affection, um, we, we, we start losing intimacy between each other, and that's a big problem. 
And finally, the other two type of uh, conflicts that we should avoid is the martyr one. Both have to do with the martyr, which is the one martyr, the, the one that says, okay, I don't care. Let me wash all the dishes and let me do everything. And eventually, this is the person in the relationship or the parent that will feel depressed, that will feel alone, that will feel disappointed with all the others. And perhaps in the fourth occasion, will be will start attacking and start saying things that will never be erased again, like you disgust me, like I don't want to see you ever inside the house. So yes, that, that's hard, but this is what happens. So um, before going to the exercise, so uh, a useful tactic in order, to, yeah, it is to be the wise mediator in this disagreement, <coughs> is to take a step back and say, okay, I don't want to be the one that targets, but I want to act like the wise meditator. And in order sometimes to do this, you have to use the word me instead of you. If I come home back and I have done nothing, and my wife does everything in the house, I'll have to say, I'm sorry, it's me the one that had time for this, and I really wanted to help, and I understand that I don't help a lot, but I really want to do something instead of pointing you to someone and say it's you. And sometimes this is like um, a tactic that can be really useful in a case like that. So, okay, I'll skip the exercise because I think that I'm running out of time here. And uh, the exercise would be for you to be this wise mediator if you recall your latest agreement and so on. And uh, the last thing about the child's uh, environment is about uh, the ability uh, to calm the other's emotion needs, uh, the ability to calm the other's emotion, that we really count on that the goodwill. Um, so uh, to enhance our emotions here, in order to have uh, the goodwill, we need two things. One thing is, uh, the correspondence to anyone's participating in the family of the needs for connection. And the second thing is to see our partner and uh, that he's like an, uh, a friend, he's like a partner, he's not an enemy here. And uh, about this, uh, in the book it's mentioned some two experiments that were made in the past and are widely used in the psychotherapy. Two experiments made by John Godman for couples. Uh, the first one, they had many couples that were wired in order to understand the past and everything. And they were discussing openly about things in their relationship. And when they do that, they were counting how anxious they were when they had this discussion. So they divided them into two basic uh, categories. Those that were feeling had anxiety when discussing about topics about their relationship, which were the disasters, and those what were cool, and they were very cool discussing with the other, with the partner about their their uh, relationship. But they were called the masters. So this pyramid was uh, done to the same couples after many years ago, and of course those that were disaster, we can understand that we had most of them many problems in their relationship, while the other that was cool and were trying to see the other one like a partner, it was really helpful for them and they had a much more healthier relationship. And another uh, e e example of uh, the chief prayer on his day was to have some couples inside the country house for one day and let them speak for whatever they want or they can do whatever they do in the daily routine. So for instance, if someone was reading a book, the other was, let's say, seeing him, and maybe the first one in the, in the master's occasion said, okay, I'm reading this, would you like to hear something? So they would see an actual uh, attempt to connect to the other. So that is like a very important thing to, to observe this, uh, this uh, connection request, let's say. So, okay, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, feelings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen this face. Sorry? I've, I have seen this face. You have experienced that too sometimes? Because I do. Yeah, my son does the same. Ah, okay. Sometimes days, I think, will look like that. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. So, um, 
feeling. Perhaps it's uh, the most important topic of this book, and uh, I, I, I consider also the author like the base of every uh, good uh, mental health. And uh, the first thing about the feeling is that it's to, to the, um, the way we try to learn to treat them that we treat our, um, how to treat, for instance, our kids. We say we try to treat our kids not like eyes, but with empathy, with uh, sensitivity. So in order to try to establish a healthy relationship with that. And perhaps that is the most important thing we can do to our kids, to understand that they have someone that uh, it's on the other side, but understand their feelings and try to be uh, near them. So, beside the good feelings, sometimes our kid must have this kind of feelings, like he's uh, disappointed or he has anger or whatever. We must learn our kids to understand every feeling they have, not to just say, okay, no, 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 don't feel that. They should be like, feel every feeling and that should feel okay with their feelings because they, they try to do things like suppress their feelings this would may have problem this would this would may cause problem in their mental health in the future so we have here three ways to treat feelings either our feelings or our kids feelings so in both of these occasions uh, the way is the same either we suppress them and say it's nothing important this feeling don't uh, feel at all, move on. Over, we overreact about the things that happen in our life and we're like drama queens for everything. Or we stay cool and restrained and we say that, okay, um, this, this feel happened. I'm really sorry that you feel this way or I feel this way, but that's life and eventually this will pass and I am here for you. Um, the importance of validating feelings uh, for me, it's really, really important, and so one of the things that I put like a bullet for myself on how important I find this thing. Uh, when a kid says, I don't like this, it's pink, I like the other, it's red, we may, what does he say? What's the difference? And we cancel his feelings. But it's not us that we can say how important this is for this kid or not. Because under this um, uh, uh, our reaction, it's like we don't validate his feeling. So the kid understands that they have a war. So maybe I don't want to express other feelings because I don't feel any point in telling him that because the kid doesn't have the criteria to understand what is big or what is small. Now that we are grown up, we can understand that. But perhaps, okay, I don't like ice cream. Yeah, and we say, okay, but I don't care. Uh, maybe I don't tell him the other bleak thing I, I have in my mind. It was like I did the piano lessons. But maybe the parents say, I paid so much money, we have to do the, the piano lessons. But instead, he would ask, why do you don't like the piano lesson? It's because I feel uncomfortable. Why do you feel? Because the teacher touched me behind, uh, in the, uh, between my legs and I don't feel good by doing that. So, yeah, that, that's an example here, and I feel that the kid, for the kid, it could be the same, like the, the creepy kid teacher that touched him, and this pencil that is, uh, uh, let's say, pink or not red, for him, it's like the same feeling. He doesn't understand exactly, so we don't have to cancel the feeling, we have to be there, and even if we think that it's really small, you have to act like, okay, I want to to listen to you, and I will be there, and we will discuss that thing. And of course, okay, we identified some minor thing, we could somehow resolve it easier, in case something worse happened, I hope so not. So, um, and uh, the last part in this slide is the danger of disallowing feelings, because um, sometimes uh, we, we, we think that we live in uh, the perfect world, an example that the author said is like uh, when I was young, uh, a friend of my father came to the house and we were all together and he asked me, do you have a happy childhood? And I said, no. And my father said, what? You don't have a happy childhood? How could it be? Everything is perfect in our house. I said, yeah, okay, I have. <laughs> <laughs> now she understands that at the moment she gave his, her parent an opportunity to connect with her 
and her feelings. But he did it, or maybe not at that moment, but later on. So he would do like that, and we don't hear the feelings. Uh, there are also many dangers that can happen. Like it was a specific couple that had a kid that thought everything was okay, and suddenly this 10 year old kid uh, went on the fifth floor and was ready to go down and suicide. I said, What? And they luckily took him and they saved him. And they then started the psychotherapy. It was like, it's not everything perfect. And for the kid, he may misheard something in the phone that, okay, this nanny left, now we have to find another nanny, and we don't know who, who to put him, so we have to go outside, and he feels himself a burden. He doesn't understand um, uh, that, uh, what actually, he doesn't have a criteria to understand that, okay, changing a nanny and don't have uh, one at the moment is not something different for him, maybe it was, and maybe perhaps there were other things. So it's always a big thing not to keep our, uh, our kids outside, but always try to embrace their feelings. Uh, okay, we can move to the next one. I will be quicker. I don't know what time is it, but we have table soon. So, uh, yes, uh, okay. So, felt with, no, uh, not felt with. Um, this is also part of validating uh, feelings, which um, we have to put like uh, emotion inside our world and perhaps if we try to resolve a problem that our kid has and he feels that we feel it, we're not dealing with it, it could it would perhaps make him get closer to us. If for instance um, uh, a kid wants let's say to go to Disneyland or wants to go outside he said, I want to go outside and you never take me outside. And the parent would have like a, a discussion that, okay, I, have, I take you all time outside, I, I don't want now. And they have like bridge, but they have like a barrier between them. But instead, if the parent was trying to describe the feelings with the world and to show him that he feels his pain, and I understand that you want to go to, uh, to uh, out outside of the park. Do you remember when we went to the Legoland uh, the previous month? Yes, I remember. Did you have a, a, a good time there? Yes, I had. So that was a move that made the kid feel like closer to him. But not like we are opponent, but with, yes, I try to be uh, closer to you. So, um, the pursuit, uh, the importance of accepting every move. Okay, um, it's if every parent is asked of uh, how he wants his kids to be, every parent will say, "I want my kids to be every time happy and have all the good emotions inside him." But of course, this is something that is not happening actually in the real world, and it's something that it's not protecting the the kid from the real world. So it's really like very important to prepare him and give him examples of the real life and to accept every move that may the kid have. Um, and this is something that perhaps we as role models, the parents could do, when one parent comes back in the house and he's really tired and can say, yes, I understand that you are tired, that you were taking care of the kids all day, but yes, I would like to help you also. That I want to be a part and I want to somehow make you uh, to be helpful and have you closer to me. Uh, so, and the last thing about this uh, thing is that, as we say in many things in life, that happiness is, uh, is like a journey, that what matters is the journey, uh, uh, the whole journey and not just the destination. So probably that would be a way to identify happiness in our lives. Um, okay, so as we have already in the previous we said about distraction of the feelings, um, just very quickly say that uh, it is a manipulative tactic and sometimes it can help, especially if you have smaller kids like you, but it's not always the best to do it because in the long term this uh, kid will understand that uh, someone is like being a little bit hypocritical with me. But perhaps not the younger one, but the bigger. So it's always good instead of using this manipulative tactic to 
uh, have, let's say, a process of uh, understanding all his feelings and all his emotions and not distracting away. So, yeah, if you like later on perhaps to make an exercise, uh, if you feel, uh, let's say, distracted from your own feelings, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can, how, how is that exercise? I put it, but I don't recall yet, but okay, let's, let's keep this distracted from your own feelings, just to stay to make a step back in the house, do your own. So, Sorry, I need my notes in order to uh, yeah, be okay. So, laying the foundation, so pregnancy. There were many topics about how to lay a foundation. Mostly have to do with uh, all the phases that a woman has since it's pregnant, all the first parts of her life. Uh, it's important, but still I didn't include them in the presentation and because of lack of time as it seemed, but also because I think it's purely uh, dedicated to this specific connection between the mother and the kid and it's not like a more unique uh, issue of connection. But pregnancy is really a big and important part because uh, whenever you become a parent and you, and you create a baby of your own, it's like... and. It's not only for the pregnancy, and it's not that a mother, it's not someone who adopts a kid. Of course, you can adopt a kid and have the same faces, but the pregnancy is like, it's the pre-phase before having the kid. Perhaps it's something that also a mother that adopts a kid could experience, is the first part of establishing your connection. It's the part that you start to realize someone else is coming, and this is a very critical moment because Everyone at this moment is trying to give you the, the good direction. This is the perfect pregnancy. There is no perfect pregnancy. You are not expecting a burden inside you. You are not expecting a living God inside you. you. You are expecting a living human being that will be your kid. And at that, even, even at that moment, you are starting to establish your connection with him. And it's uh, uh, really important because uh, this path um, uh, uh, doesn't include, as I said, guides, but the way you start seeing your kids during the pregnancy will affect the way you will see later on. So it's like an important path inside uh, this uh, foundation. So the next thing is the parent tribes. Uh, let me see where I have this. Okay. So uh, in academia, for decades, uh, usually parents were divided into two categories, the, regula the regulators and the facilitators. Uh, the regulators are those, uh, okay, I, I put this slide here, this specifically that because I don't 100% agree with the author on this one, although I agree with many things he said, because he said that probably, I think he's saying that facilitator is better. A regulator, a regulator is the parent that wants to create a concrete program for his kid that you wake up this time, you eat this time, you sleep at this time, and so on, and perhaps in the next phases in his life you will have another everyday program, and the parent creates the program and the kids adopt to it. On the other side, the facilitator is one that also likes to have an everyday routine program, but says, I want my kid to create this program and I will adapt in it. Which, okay, uh, could be a solution. And the author said that she prefers, I think, this kind of uh, way. Although, in the end, what she said that the important thing is that we have uh, acceptance and kindness in our relationship with our kids. But I think that you can yourself think and could identify yourself if you would be or are regulators and facilitators as parent tribes. Okay, um, so uh, parent, we need to be parenting in turn. Sometimes, even as parents, uh, we can be like totally different, we like a regulator in our first kid and a facilitator to the other. So we can have a different um, a different race for the first kid and a different for the next ones, for instance. So um, the, the important thing here is 
to understand that we are part of this chain, that we are part of this link inside this chain, and the way either we were raised or either we raise the one key or the other, it's like this race should also include this kind of affection, this kind of loving and this kind of connection of the emotions between the two, the two parts, the parent and the kid. And uh, as an example here of how different parenting could occur, there is an example, and how this affects us eventually and our kids, is that there were like two twins who were born from the same mother, but because the one was sick, he needed to stay in the hospital for some months, and uh, the other was okay to go home. So the mother chose to stay in the hospital and assist the kid that had the most issues with its health. So eventually, she got very close to this one, while the other used to have since day one nannies. So when she went back home, she felt like a distance from the other, because she thought her kid was the first, not the second. So eventually, although they were the same uh, uh, human beings, identical, let's say, twins, that were parent by the same people, they, they grew up and they had so different personalities that the one that, although was sick at first, eventually felt like uh, very good in his life, very confident and so on, and he felt strong connection with his uh, family and his mother, while the second one always needed like confirmation. He was running for everyone in the house, he was doing wheels for everyone because he always needed the need to, uh, to be approved and he always needed because he was lacking this kind of connection with his mother and that caused him a lot. So that is like a big thing to do that how the parenting even in the same kid could be like cause so many different things and that is important to understand that this link is important to give only the good things as much as possible keep out the, the burdens. Um, okay, let's go to the attachment theory that um, in, and it's almost the final slide so we are over. Uh, it's uh, that we have seen parents. We have our parents and we have seen parents, our friends and so on. We understand how parents can be. Kids don't understand that. When they are born, they are like Okay, you are the role prototype. You, whatever you do, you are the part, and that's what I get. So, it's very important uh, to help them have these first memories they have as human beings uh, with a good, uh, let's say, with a good connection, because this kind of uh, first impression will be in their mind. Uh, I don't know the word in English, to be honest, in the assimilated and postmodal, in the deeper mind, let's say, um, the deepest memories of them. So there are four kinds of attachment theory, and of, and of course, the important one is the secure. The secure is like when we have a kid, for instance, an example is when he's a baby boy or girl, and he cries and he feels his parents are there to foster him, to feed him to help him not cry, and we help this kid turn to a secure and be a more confident and feel good for himself. Um, the primitive pipe, the one with the anxiety, is the one that wakes up and starts crying and doesn't feel like someone is listening to him, but he has to cry in order to get the affection from the parents. So when he wakes up, when he grows up and he becomes like an adult, he sometimes says, okay, I'm not something super because I'm not some something special, I'm okay because in order to get from other people uh, affection and stuff, I have to try, I have to do something in order for other people to notice me. Uh, the, the dismissive is uh, the distant one, is the one that the kid that cries, but the parent, either because they don't care or because they are thinking that that's the correct way to uh, make him, to, to, to raise him is that he cries, no, he's in bed, and he, even if he cries, we don't care, he will stop crying at the moment. But this kind of uh, distant approach is making a kid like, uh, um, I have no one. Uh, when I want something and I ask for someone, nobody cares for me, so I stop crying and stop demanding. And that will eventually turn this kid, when he becomes an adult, to be like more, isolated, to be more, have depression and so on. And this similar is like the fearful where 
although uh, it's the same like the dismissive, but moreover, his cry will lead to some bad action from his parents, which like the world that would happen. And in this kind of cases, uh, this is really feel isolated. He has big problems with mental health and feels like it's, there is no point in having human interaction with anyone. All people are upset, exactly like him. So, yeah, it's very important to understand that in uh, the attachment we have to create secure and uh, uh, positive attachment connection with, with our kids. And this example is like, if you feel yourself you are adults and you want to make this example in this kind of situation, that you are in the desert. And the secure one is like you are in the desert and you need something and you find it, water, the preoccupied is like you are in the desert alone and suddenly you need water and you cry and you stir and someone brings it to you and the dismissive and fearful is like no one will come here. They pass by you and they won't help and even they hit you. So that is how the kids feel when they cry if you want to see in their lives how do they feel. So uh, as a last exercise and that is the end of the presentation is, uh, I think, I don't remember something else, yes? Uh, the example, okay, and uh, this is my boy, and he thanks you along with me. Because...